Hello, I'm Sarah Kajelski. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist at Mass General for Children and the Mass General Lurie Center for Autism. I'm going to be talking about constipation in autism, which affects many Myrie syndrome patients. We're gonna start by an overall introduction to GI issues in autism. This talk is going to focus on constipation, but we will also discuss anal stenosis, potty training, and feeding difficulties, as well as the microbiome in autism. GI issues are very common in children with autism. Estimates range from 25 to 75% of children at some point will have a GI problem. These are all the same GI issues that occur in any other child, including constipation, diarrhea, abdominal pain, acid reflux, or GERD, as well as feeding difficulties. However, in patients with autism, these GI problems might present differently due to communication challenges. They might present as nonspecific behavioral changes. They might show up as repetitive verbal phrases, saying tummy or go to the doctor. Sometimes parents wonder if their children are repeating something they've seen in a show and scripting, or if they're trying to indicate that they are specifically having pain themselves. Some children present with repetitive motor behaviors, maybe tapping on their stomach or tapping on their chest if they're having acid reflux. Um, these can be one mistaken for uh, stims or tics, um, but if it's, if it's a new issue, um, it's important to consider a medical, pro a medical cause. Some children have even more nonspecific behaviors such as tantrums or self-injury or aggression. These could be com completely behavioral, but especially if they are related to feeding or toileting, um, I would consider a medical cause such as constipation or um, abdominal pain. Specific GI issues in Myrie syndrome have been covered in another talk previously. Um, in addition to constipation, this includes feeding difficulties, duodenal atresia, pyloric stenosis, duodenal stenosis, duodenal strictures, and anal stenosis. Most of these I'm not going to cover today as they, I mentioned they've been covered in another talk. So today we're going to focus on constipation. First of all, what is the definition of constipation? Many of these descriptions might be intuitive. This includes infrequent stools, less than three per week, which would be less than every other day. Hard or painful stools, or difficulty passing stools, pushing and straining. However, there can be atypical presentations of constipation. Some children are passing regular bowel movements. However, over time, things still can, can get backed up. Um, perhaps these are kids who present with self-injury or aggression, and some, some doctor along the way orders an x-ray that actually shows a large amount of stool in the abdomen. Parents might be surprised if their children have has been passing regular bowel movements. Some children might describe the sensation that they just don't feel empty. They're going to the bathroom, they're passing stool, but they just always feel full. Um, or it could present with frequent bowel movements or bathroom visits. In addition, another way that, that this can present is encopresis, which is overflow, and can show up as fecal incontinence or accidents. This picture is showing that with a large stool burden, the rectum can become stretched or dilated, and there may be leakage of loose or stool around it. Often children don't even feel that it's happening and it's not something that they have control over. Once we identify that constipation is the cause, we use a combination of medications and toileting routines to fix the constipation. And after several months or longer of passing regular bowel movements, um, the goal is that the the rectum and the colon will come back down to a normal size. The muscles and the nerves will work together better um, in terms of holding things in and helping the child be aware that they need to go. And the leakage or encopresis will no longer be a problem. So what causes constipation? Many of these, ish these factors can occur all in the same patient. Restricted diets. Some kids might be eating too much of foods that are binding such as carbohydrates, crackers, bread, chips, um, or dairy products. 
Some kids are dairy sensitive, not all. Or maybe they're not e eating enough of the other foods that might be helping with constipation, such as fruits and vegetables or high, higher whole grain foods that have higher fiber. Lower muscle tone can contribute to constipation, both with the motility of the intestine itself, as well as their ability to push and pass stool when they're sitting on the toilet. Getting less physical activity can slow things down and contribute to constipation. In addition, uh, routines or being having rigid behaviors. Perhaps these are children who only want to use the bathroom at home, and so they hold it all day while they're at school. Communication challenges also contribute to constipation, as well as altered recognition of body sensations and attentional issues. Um, children might not just not be paying attention to their cues, or maybe they're not sitting long enough on the toilet for complete evacuation. They're passing one or two small stools, but really they need to sit for longer in order to get it all out. This picture shows the proper positioning on the toilet for a child. Um, if the feet can't reach the floor, I would encourage you to use a stool or even a stack of some thick books um, with the goal of having the knees form an, uh, the lower in the, the lower legs and the upper legs forming a 90 degree angle. This uh, position helps to relax the pelvic muscles and then it should be easier for the child to pass the bowel movement. Children who are not sitting on the toilet um, and are going in pull-ups or diapers or having accidents um, might tend to stand up and that this allows them to clench and hold stool in. Um, so over time, hopefully we can get them into a proper position. The treatment of constipation invo involves first dietary changes and then medication and as well as toileting routines. Dietary changes could include increasing fluids, specifically water. Um, try to avoid increasing milk. Um, as I mentioned, some children are dairy sensitive and if they're having too much milk or yogurt or cheese, over time this can, this can increase constipation, but water should help. Try to increase fruits and vegetables and increase high fiber foods, um, such as whole grains. I would avoid fiber supplements, which actually tend to bulk up the stools and make them bigger and harder to pass, especially in children who aren't drinking enough water. And you might consider a trial of, of dairy-free or at least limiting dairy products. This is helpful for some children, but not all. If dietary changes aren't enough, the next step would be to move to medication. We usually start with stool softeners, such as polyethylene glycol or lactulose which hold more water into the bowel, into the stool to make the bowel movement softer. If that's not enough, the next step would be to add a stimulant laxative such as Senna or Bisacodyl, and this helps with contractions of the colon to move the, the stool through. Um, for some children, these can be used just occasionally um, for maybe if they, they're usually going every day, but every once in a while, they'll skip a few days, um, or some children need this on a much more regular basis. I also use magnesium frequently or other medications to help with motility, which might be a little bit gentler than the stimulant laxatives, um, but again, help with the, the tone of the colon and as well as the contractions and the motility. Um, many patients with severe constipation end up needing a rectal medication, um, such as a suppository or an enema, but we might need to use these sparingly in patients with Myrie syndrome um, due to ris the risk of trauma and fibrosis or scarring. Some patients don't respond to the initial medication approach. This might be because they're so full of stool um, that there's just more than what the medications can address. Um, in those cases, some patients might need actually a constipation clean out, which would be one, two, or even three days of higher doses of medication in order to liquefy the stool, help flush everything out, and act as a reset button. After, often after a constipation clean out, we're able to return to the initial doses of medication and they work much more effectively. As I mentioned, overall, just no matter what the dietary changes or medications are, the toileting routines are going to be in incredibly helpful and important um, for treatment, treating constipation. All right, next we're going to talk about potty training. Potty training might be delayed in patients with autism and Myri syndrome. Why? Very similar re reasons as constipation. Constipation itself can be a cause for potty training delay, 
If kids are scared to have a bowel movement because it's going to hurt, they're gonna hold it and be less likely to wanna to sit on the toilet and pass their stool. Um, I'm gonna talk about some tips, um, but sometimes additional supports beyond what parents can do alone might be necessary. This could include behavioral support with ABA, visual aids, social stories, or occupational therapy support for toileting skills. So in terms of tips, first of all, try to avoid constipation. Um, be proactive when there is a change in routine that might trigger it. Um, starting school, the birth of a, a sibling, um, moving to a new house are all notorious causes of constipation. Having a break from school, so going on vacation, um, even if you're staying home, the child's routines could still be much different. Um, and as well as, as especially going on a trip and being in an unfamiliar place. Try to include toilet time in your daily routines. Um, if you ask a child who's busy playing and happy, do they wanna sit on the potty? Of course, they're going to say no. Um, but if you try to build it into your routine, first we have breakfast, then we sit on the potty, then we go to school, that helps to um, make it a more part of their routine. Also try to use similar routines and language at home, school, and in other locations. Start with no stress or pressure, avoid battles of forcing a child to sit on the potty. Sometimes you, you might in the beginning just need to reward them for sitting, regardless of whether or not they actually produce a bowel movement. And for children who, res who even resist sitting on the toilet um, and prefer to keep their pull-up or diaper on um, and poop in a different place, start just by trying to encourage them to go into the bathroom when they need to have a bowel movement. And then over time, you can work on the sitting part. Anal stenosis can cause severe constipation. This is a narrowing of the anal canal. This can cause difficulty passing stool. Symptoms include constipation, abdominal pain, bloating, pain with passage of stool, or small stools. This can be caused by spasm or um, muscle contractions. It can be caused by scarring, chronic diarrhea, because there's only a, a, a small narrow amount of stool passing through, trauma, or a parasite infection. Anal stenosis is associated with Mirey syndrome because of the fibrosis or scarring. It can be challenging to differentiate, differentiate anal stenosis from constipation alone, and the diagnosis would require a procedure um, such as imaging or a motility study. The primary treatment of anal stenosis is addressing constipation, so avoiding large or hard stools so that they will pass through a na more narrowed area more easily. In more severe cases, treatment might also include dilation, which is stretching the area, an injection of medication, or surgery. Any of these more invasive treatments could be problematic in patients with Mirey syndrome, again, because of the risk of, of scarring or fibrosis. So we try to avoid those if at all possible. Feeding difficulties overlap, overlap significantly with constipation in autism and in Mirey syndrome. It's very common to have picky eaters who have a self-restricted diet. They only eat a few foods um, or they're resistant to trying new foods. And this limited diet can be a major contributing factor to constipation. For kids who are picky eaters, try to avoid grazing. So keeping regular meal and snack times um, and drink only water in between meals and snacks. Anytime they drink anything that has calories in it. So milk or juice, um, that's going to reset their hunger, and then it's going to be several hours before they're hungry again. Try to offer a variety of foods, but include at least one or two foods at every meal that you know your child will eat. And then include your child in other exposures to food, even without the pressure to eat it. So take them grocery shopping, involve them in food preparation, and help let them serve, maybe serve the, the food to other plates. Some kids become very specific to brands or to the packaging. I know many kids who will only eat one brand of one flavor of yogurt and only with a specific character on the package. So if you can try to serve foods out of their original packaging, like pouring the yogurt into a bowl, um, that might help to protect against that. The last topic is the microbiome. What is the microbiome? This is the population of microorganisms that live in the body. There are 10 times more microbes than human cells. 
the microbiome is, affects your health in many different ways. It can affect the immune system, um, synthesizing vitamins, metabolism, inflammation, mood, and bowel habits and GI symptoms. There are multiple factors that determine the microbiome, including diet and supplements, antibiotics, probiotics, and infections, the environment, as well as exercise, stress, and genetics. There are many conditions and diseases associated with an imbalance in the microbiome, which is called dysbiosis. These include obesity, diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, cancer, and autism spectrum disorder. So there have been studies that show that children with autism do have an altered microbiome. This dysbiosis can be associated with GI symptoms and behavioral changes in autism. This picture A shows a normal healthy intestine. Picture B shows intestinal dysbiosis. As you compare A to B, you will notice that the dysbiosis picture contains a decreased variety. So there is less microbial biodiversity. In addition, there are more of the bad microbes and fewer of the good microbes. The picture on the right, starting from the yellow, shows that there is an increased amount of proteobacteria and bacteroides, which are considered the bad bacteria, and decreased amount of the good bacteria, such as Firmicutes and actin actinobacteria. This dysbiosis can in turn uh, produce toxic metabolites that create proteins that cause inflammation and affect autism symptoms, both neurologic, behavioral, um, as well as GI symptoms. So how can we keep, keep the gut microbiome healthy? This, these pictures were meant for adults, but we can extra extrapolate for kids. One, reduce stress. Two, increase physical activity and exercise, which improves gut bacteria. Three, avoid antibiotics. Four, consider using supplements like prebiotics and probiotics. Hopefully we'll have more recommendations um, in the future. Number five, eat a diverse variety of foods. Number six, include fermented fruit foods, which are nat contain natural probiotics, such as kimchi, kefir, yogurt, and sauerkraut. And number seven, reduce the use of artificial sweeteners. As I mentioned, there is emerging data that addressing the dysbiosis in autism may have benefits for GI symptoms as well as the core neurologic and developmental symptoms of autism. Current and future research is looking at probiotics, um, such as specifically uh, which ones to use and which children might respond, dietary changes, such as a gluten-free diet or a dairy-free diet, or fecal microbial transplant or FMT, which has currently been only been studied in very small groups and is not an approved treatment yet. We hope in the future to understand better what treatment to use and who might benefit from it. There might be subtypes of children who are more likely to respond to one, type, one treatment than another. In summary, constipation is a common GI problem in children with autism and in Myrie syndrome. We discussed why constipation might occur. The treatment of constipation involves medication and behavioral strategies. Associated issues such as feeding difficulties and an altered microbiome, as well as potty training strategies in children with constipation and autism. Dysbiosis is common, and in the future we hope to gain more insight about how to address dysbiosis so that we can better treat GI and neurologic symptoms of autism. Thank you.